museum. This show has done exceedingly well for us, and yes, I mean sales too. If you came to the opening exhibition, you probably saw something entirely different. We had about 18 paintings or so, and we've sold maybe seven. There's more to come. So we are thrilled for Jill. On top of that, she's been reviewed by several uh, art blogs, major writers, Christina Key, Peter Malone, David Jacobson, the major, major folks. Um, we're also thrilled to have Amy Ryan here tonight, who is an artist and writer based in Brooklyn. This is going to be so interesting. A.B. Um, has written for the Brooklyn Rail, On Verge, other places. Um, she has a com comparative literature, a bachelor's degree from Princeton, and also a BFA from Rutgers University. Did you, did you take a class from John Lear at all? No. Oh, he shows at this gallery. He shows in September here. He was the dean of the art school for many years. So but really why we're interested in A.B. and Jill talking is she did a paper on Goethe's color theory. And so as you can see, Jill Nathanson is obviously interested in color here and her what she's done throughout the years with color and her process. So uh, I will leave it to you two, and I can't wait to hear her all about it. Um, so I, I was really delighted that Jill asked me to do this conversation with her. Um, since I first saw the paintings in the show, we've had this really wonderful, wide-ranging conversation, both in person and by email, about color. Um, and some of the things we've talked about, as Christina mentioned, are just color theory, but also reverse perspective in Russian icons, and sort of astonishing role of color in the Kabbalah. Um, so I'm looking forward to sharing some of that, and continuing some of that conversation tonight. Um, as Christina mentioned, I'm an artist and a writer, um, and primarily a sculptor, but looking at painting and thinking about painting have always been critical to how I think about my own work. Um, and I, I guess maybe just to start things off, I wanted to just um, share something that Robert Irwin said, which for me has always been very important in terms of how I think about art. And he said that, um, you know, if you can change how you bring the world into focus, that can in time change the culture itself. And I think the way that Jill brings, brings color into the world, and that focus into the world, is one of those things. Well, um, it's a funny thing, so Baby and I just met at my opening, and um, my friend Elisa Dorito was here, said, oh, you didn't have a gallery talk or something? <laughs> <laughs> I thought, well, I don't know how to do that or what to do. And, and meanwhile, we were sort of going back and forth. I, I looked A.B. on my mind, and I saw that she had written about things that really interested me, so we started kind of emailing, and I thought, well, this is a conversation, let's just do this. So, you know, it's kind of an experiment. Um, and, you know, a lot of the time when people look at these paintings, they think, oh, well, how did you do it? And they want to know about the technique. And it, it, the conversation keeps going to technique, mm -hmm. but it's really, the color is really everything. And I have such a long history with, like, Color and A.B. wrote a paper on Goethe's color theory, and I asked if she could send it to me, and she wrote back and she said, "Well, it's really about an argument with Kant about Kant's first critique. If you still want to read it, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. Okay. So she sent it to me, and it's a beautiful paper, and there were parts that I could not follow, but it's very, very readable, and." It's about how this way of thinking about color versus color theory, which I can never understand because it's so sort of rangy and wide, it, 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 it became very exciting and very close to the adventure of being a colorist and trying to find your way and you know, do something with color. So, that's how we're going to start, right? That's going to start. <laughs> so I just, so I, I'm going to, I'm, I just want to start about myself a little bit. Um, so I went to Bennington in the 1970s when color painting was kind of prevalent or just on the wane. And most of my classmates were 
turning away from color field painting and doing other kinds of things. And a lot of people who were painters who remember that moment. But I personally was very excited about something in color field painting, even though I didn't really love that many of the actual paintings I saw. I loved some, many, but there were many that I didn't love. Um, color field painting both completely excited me and often irritated me. And instead of turning away from it, my whole life since then has been about trying to find out what it is that that's great there and expand that and take it further and stuff. Well, one of the things that I find very strange about your paintings is how the color seems to breathe and swell and build. And in that sense, seems to be entering our space. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, so I think I wondered if maybe you could talk about how, because I think the color of the cane is being very flat, mm -hmm. and yours isn't. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I guess I think in terms of movement all the time, I think of color dynamics. And I usually think of the color dynamics as being kind of side to side, like, you know. In the 90s, I started doing studies with, I thought of them as being you know, just like quadripartite paintings with the kind of diagonal, four diagonal shapes. And they weren't shapes, they were color fields. I thought of them as four interacting color fields. And I thought of them, we're going to just do this all night. <laughs> <laughs> um, I thought of them as uh, kind of fields that were moving back and forth and that they were unified. And I thought about, always thought about pushing and pulling. But in order to, that the color was sort of pushing and pulling and, and forming a unity, but in order to do that, it always seemed to have to have some space in order for that operation to occur, in order for that unification to occur. So I just kind of accepted it, yeah, that they're going to have space. And I think that these, you know, some of them are overlapped so that they're multicolored fields, but some of them are just airy fields, but they seem to need to have that. But then there's the part that we were talking about before that has to do with your ideas about your reading of um, Russian icons and reverse perspective. She wrote an incredible paper about that. I was thinking in the early 20th century about that. Um, that instead of the painting being deep, the painting comes out in deep. And I guess that's something that was always really kind of part of color field painting. Mm -hmm. Certainly, I was very close to the work of Kenneth Dolan when I was a student, and the way that the the, um, the, um, the targets come out of it, and each color has a different kind of a space. It's always exciting to me, but I wasn't that interested in the unit in this sort of simple unity that they were unified. Um, I wonder, 
Yeah, how did you, how did you, how do you feel about those sort of two orders of color, or two orders of heat? It's funny. Yeah. I think about it that bad in a lot of different ways, but um, one thing is it just seems to set, the, it sets the surface at a certain amount of tension. And without tension, I think, that, you know, it's just too floaty. It's like, just it's so not interesting to me. And it needs to be often kind of moored and there's kind of a pressure that I can set up with that um, without ruining the color. Because a lot of the time, you know, I think I, well, I, the other thing is they set up the, the scale. So if you're, using, if you're using these small bits of color, which sometimes have um, a strong intensity, uh, it, they'll always change intensity against what they're, you know, what, what they're on. So it just it sets up the contrast to make the language of it all work. But it's also, it's like a pressure, and sometimes that pressure makes everything else kind of push forward. I don't know how that is, but it's, you know, there, there's just a whole bunch of things that are happening with these spatial. I don't even know what they are, but it has to get complicated or it's not interesting. <laughs> I mean, maybe if we could um, talk a bit, um, go back a bit to, to Goethe and Goethe's color theory, which is, if you've ever seen it, it's about 700 pages long, and, you know, it's... Sure. <laughs> um, it's about 700 pages long and consists of, well, it's almost like a theater of color, um, all kinds of different color experiments, um, and Goethe to have what I would call like an ethics of looking. Um, he took issue with Sir Isaac Newton's breaking light into a prism. He, that idea that, you know, the essence of light could be revealed in an experiment. Um, Goethe took the other point of view. It's like you can never know anything about light, but the co but colors are the acts and passions of light. Um, <laughs> And so that's why and his idea about looking was that you had to you had to know everything about how color interacted with other colors, with other kinds of colors. He was fascinated by the mutability of color, how some colors and, and it's sort of the, the temporality of colors. Some he describes as you know undetainably fleeting, others temporary. Yet, but enduring for a bit of time, and others that can be arrested, but always they turn, um, depending on the quality of the light. So it's that kind of richness and temporality of color, and I feel that's sort of like the bread and butter. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I, you know, I, I guess just so many years of thinking of how can color painting do more. You know, I just felt like color painting was so exciting when I first met it. Yes, the, the color painting was so exciting when I first met it in the 70s. This girl, you know, when I first had contact with color field painting. And then it just, you know, I didn't know how to expand it, I had to extend it. So I've just done color studies all the time for so many years. And I feel like there's all these discoveries. So when I read this about Goethe, this was his standard, this was his ethics that you had to expand and find every way that this happened, you know, just explore and expand instead of, you know, making rules or, you know, whatever. Um, just very, very exciting. And it was a kind of a, like an ethics of painting in a way, right? You know, um, that, yeah. Um, maybe one other um, very short text to bring in conversation is by Walter Benjamin, who's a great scholar of Frida. But he wrote a very short piece called A Child's View of Color. And he talks, in it he talks about how for a child, color is spiritual. And it's clarity and, and translucency is, that that's a spiritual quality. Like adults see color almost as though it were a slipcover over like the more, you know, important real objects. And he, you know, wanted to like really foreground this other way of looking at color. So you know that kind of translucency that seems to bring, you know, bring to mind a, a more 
yeah, childlike or joyful way of thinking or being of color? Well, I have to say, when I read that, and this is a little bit of a digression from sure. our happy, happy conversation here, which is <laughs> that when I was, you know, coming up through this, the 70s and the 80s and the 90s, like being a color painter was like, how dumb can you be? You know? How childish can you be if you're just interested in color? You know, no structure, no meaning, no this or that. And so that was always been kind of painful. So it was kind of fun to read that. Um, and then there's another piece to it, which is that when I, when I read, I had never read the Benjamin uh, fragment before, which is apparently something that a lot of people have read. Um, it reminded me of, of kind of a spiritual practice that I came to know about after I had been doing um, these studies for a very long time, well, for a number of years. And um, I found that in uh, the 13th through the 18th century, uh, in uh, Jewish Kabbalistic prayer, that there was, a, there was uh, that one was meant to pray on different aspects of God and through your prayer to unify the different aspects of God. And that there was a kind of a push and pull between these aspects and a kind of dynamism and a certain amount of, of challenge and difficulty in doing this unification, which is a unification of one's character and ultimately a unification of the world. And um, so it's a different, kind of spirituality, spiritual connection to color, which is not so necessarily playful or childlike. But um, that also has always, you know, that for a long time that's been very meaningful to me, not that I'm any great practitioner of uh, anything, but it, it, it jives with my own sense of color and structure. And just a quick question, but it's, but you're unifying the colors in your mind, in your mind yes. right? It's sort of yes. like this abstract color painting taking place in the mind. Yes. Yes, I thought that was so kind of dazzling. It is dazzling, and I think and I think that painting is about that. I think painting. I've always felt that um, painting somehow pulls you together as a human being, and that goes back to what you were saying. I think at the beginning of what is it that you um, what is it that you get, and I think what is it that you get, and how how does seeing the world have to change? And I think that it's the challenge of of being a whole person. And I guess it's a Gestalt idea, but it's also an idea that you know we can update in our own languages and our own, own ways and our own time. Um, so you know I don't know these paintings are not doing anything all that profound necessarily, but I think that the, the quality of unification um, is something that I think about a lot. I just I'm going to sort of sidestep this for a moment, which is that. Um, any of us who are artists or have been artists for a long time who work through different eras and different you know, times in the history of painting or sculpture or whatever. And for a lot of my time as a painter, the, uh, the, the most accepted and respected kind of work was minimalism and painting that was going toward monochrome. The painting was an object, a sort of monochromatic object. And so for me, as a painter who's very excited about color and color relationships, that kind of closed me out of the game for a long time. And in a way, the project has been to get back to having color relationships after minimalism. Mm -hmm. And if you think about them, you know, there are these paintings, that the paint is very much on the surface, and it's very material. And you know that this is a rectangle in the wood. You know, you know it's a very solid, Thing. And so the idea of sort of unification of something that's an object, it's, it's, it's kind of, that's kind of where I am with it. So it's not a compositional kind of unification. It's not, um, it's not a unification in depth. It's not a, am I making sense? Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of a, yeah. Um, uh, Somebody wrote about your work, and it was, it was as though it was composed of light, space, color, and gravity. Huh. And I, I really loved that idea. Could you change this when you talk? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, someone wrote about Jill's work and said that it was composed.
composed of light, space, color, and gravity. And I really love that dimension. I think gravity is part of how you make them. But yeah. I wondered if you wanted to. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, every color has its own they, colors have their weight or their lightness, and these shapes are very much about, you know, hanging or lifting or whatever. But yeah, when I paint them, I you know I paint them, I, I pour on the floor and I pick them up and I drip down, and so everything is kind of a dripping film. Um, so I guess I think about. Do you picture color? Sorry, because I, I never wants to know. I'm sorry, but yeah. you're, you're skipping to where, but we don't know how you make. Studies with uh, plastic, translucent plastic. I do studies, and that takes an incredibly long time. That's the main thing that I do with these studies. And once I have a study that I like, I'm golden. You know, but the hard part really is getting the study. That's where the real art making goes. And then there's a lot of technique, which is also part of the art making. But the studies are really important. And then I match the translucent color of the plastics. And matching the color is really, really, really hard because this paint dries much darker and it's, when it's wet, it's very, very light. Any of this acrylic paint is very white when it's wet. So then um, I have to match the color to dry accurately. And it's a lot of paint. It looks like it's pretty thin, but it's really a lot of paint. They're very, I really don't like stain painting. These are like really anti-stain paintings. They're really on the surface. Um, and so I mix the colors, and I take a really long time. I probably mix, make a color a day, like put down a color a day. So they're pretty slow going. And then once they're kind of, you know, the big colors are down, then I spend a while, you know, going back over with the, the other marks. But um, did that answer the question? Yeah, I guess everyone that walks in here says, oh, these are encaustic. Why do you use acrylic and polymers versus encaustic? Have you used encaustic? I've tried to learn how to use encaustic, but I've always painted with acrylic, and I always have been a big experimenter with acrylic. Just from very early on, I always thought, oh, you, you, you know, try this, try that, try that. Thing. So I've always been a big uh, experimenter. And I have a, like an incredible backlog of you know, things I can do that other people haven't done because I will just do anything with acrylic. So, yeah, so that's, there, you know, I guess some, someone at one point said, oh, boy, you're not going to get anywhere with these acrylic paintings. You better, better switch to oils. <laughs> no, I can't. That's all I know how to do. So, uh, yeah. Sometimes I wonder which color you lay down first. It's kind of weird. Mm -hmm. Which? I said, some, I wonder sometimes which color is laid down first because it's, it's sort of this mysterious series yeah. of veils. <clears throat> yeah, I don't, I don't even remember on this one which one went down first, but um, one of the things that's also really important in these paintings is that the colors where the overlaps are are the most important colors. Mm -hmm. They're the colors that the painting needs the most. Mm -hmm. And so when I'm doing the studies, that's kind of the, the, the key. Because, you know, you can do endless things, putting plastic on top of plastic just always looks good. But the key is to come to something that's structurally going to be alive, that's going to pull you together, that's going to do that operation of some kind of unification. So how do you arrive at, at, the, at those the studies? It's all through the studies. It's all through the studies, and the studies, you know, it has to be, it's an emotional thing. They're visual and they're they're emotional. They're, they're really a big deal for me. I won't commit because these are a lot of work and they're expensive. You know, I, I will not do one unless I'm really happy with the study. I don't think, oh, well, it'll work out later. You know, it has to be something I can commit to. And are the studies are they much smaller? They're little, little mm -hmm. studies, and they're you know they're proportionate to this. Yeah. So the color scales up. Color scales up. Yeah, we were talking about this all day. We were talking about it. And, you know, I, and for a while, there's, there's sort of an orthodoxy. You're not supposed to do little studies and then make big paintings. 
And for a while it was clumsy and I threw away a lot of paintings because I couldn't get there. But now I find that um, I know which paintings can scale up and how much they can scale up. It's a better experience. A lot of things which didn't seem possible before now seem like I can do them because I've had a lot of experience failing. Yeah. Um, but let's see. There was something else that we were, and hope we find our way back to it, but something's very important to me is what I call um, color desire. I'm thinking about, I think about, instead of just putting, to, like a lot of painters are thinking about getting the, the surface to be alive and to come forward and to be activated, but then sometimes if you do that, then everything is just activated and it doesn't move you across. So I'm very involved with how you move across the painting. Um, I think this one's extraordinary in terms of how it can move you across. Really? Yeah. 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 How, how, how come? <laughs> well, there's, a, there's something about this sort of blade or wing-like shape. With the additional strokes, it feels like the wind's rushing past it. And yeah. then these other forms just keep moving. Yeah, I think that wasn't entirely articulate, but it's, it's so dynamic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, in a lot of paintings also, I mean, kind of, the paint, the color that you most need is kind of across the way. Like, my pink has a um, need for to be completed by green. Mm -hmm. So then, you know, the, the greens would always be here, you know, and then like the yellow, this has a purple on top of it, but the really strong purple is over there. So that's sort of the general principle, is kind of not having the complements near each other and trying to keep you needing to go across the painting one way or another. And so that's also part of it is, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that's true of, of a lot of the overdrawn, is like how to keep it moving across. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, no, so I don't know. follow where the painting's taking you? Um, you know, that's a, that's a great question. For a long time with these, I, I didn't, and some of the paintings are very close to the studies. They're very, very close to the studies. Um, so you're more in control. I'm more in control. But the thing is that the paint, you know, what happens with, with all of these kinds of incidents in the paint, that I'm not in control of. Or I'm just doing it, I think, oh yeah, that'll look good, you know, let me mess that up a little bit, or, you know, let me let it flood that way a little bit. So I'm, I'm pretty loose with the application of the paint. And so that adds a, a, an unexpected dimension. But I think recently I've gotten a little bit more loose with, and then the stuff that happens at the end, sometimes really, you know, with, with a brush, really changes the direction of the painting. Um, in, a, in a mysterious way that you just follow. Totally, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, your paint on. Yeah, absolutely. And, yeah. Um, but like, yeah, I mean, the sense of scale also really changes things. Like this, when this got painted, it just it was very different from the study. And then certain things happened. You know, yeah. You said you're very, you know, you're anti-stain painting. Yeah. Why say a little bit more about that? Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, Have a, uh, I'm very much in debt to Helen Frankenthaler. She was a great painter. But I, I never really liked the kind of the look of that stain. It's too immaterial for me. And that reminds me that the material and the color, <laughs> the material and the color are linked for me. And I think a lot about um, m m paint material as being kind of matter that's made out of energy. And I think that the color being so strong and the paintings being so material, they bring that to mind, or that's something that I hope that they bring to mind. And this goes back to what you were saying at the beginning about like, how can this 
looking at painting change how you see the world. And I, I guess, I can't believe I'm going to say this, but I want to say this. Um, that I guess I think that there's a vision in like what we, what's hap what, what happens in science that you know that we're all energy and that there's some linkage between energy and matter and all of this. And our worldview hasn't really caught up with that yet. And I think that when I first started doing color field painting, that's what I felt. I felt this kind of painting is beyond our current sense of reality. And it's about energies, and it's about life, and it's about how we participate as living beings in energy and life, and, and, and how our nervous system participates in that world of energy and life. And I thought, this is so important. And then, like, so many of the paintings were just so, like, you know, like, so de decorous and, you know, decor-like. But I think that that's the key. And I know that the color field painters, some of them were thinking about these kinds of things. And I kind of want to bring back that. And I, I guess I have it in my acrylic world. You know, that's, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah so uh, a little bit earlier, you talked about um, that, the emotionality. Um, that you that you look for or find when you're doing these studies, yeah. um, is that more something uh, along the lines of oh, I really like the way this feels, or is it something that you can articulate more? Um, it's it's more like it, it feels a little transformative, you know, like it has a it, it's. I mean, uplifting is kind of a yucky word, but it feels like it's pulling me together. It feels like it's taking me to a different plane. And you know, you know, you have that experience in art that it feels like it's just going, just taking you someplace. And that's, it's like a standard. I want it to have that standard. And then there's some hope of the painting having that standard. So that's kind of how it is. But it's also, it usually makes me feel better. Because by the time I've been doing studies for a long time, and I can't get anything good, I feel really bad. So it's just that moment of feeling like, OK, this is better. So thank you. Yeah. Jill, yeah. when you're doing a studies, do you have the painted parts in there too? The oh, overlay painted parts? Sometimes. I'm used to more than I do now. Now I kind of feel like I just have the I just have the the, um, the colors, mm -hmm. and then I figure I'll be able to link it with mm -hmm. the other other part. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Could you talk a bit more about scale in your work, and like the influence yeah. that has on how far you upset? Yeah. Well, when I first started doing these, I, I just I thought I would be you know very content to just do small paintings. That was before I started showing here and everything, and um, you know I did a lot of small paintings. But I just found as, I, as they got bigger, different things started to happen. And in particular, I feel like the bigger paintings, there's a kind of weight to them and a sense of bodily engagement um, that is really, uh, you know, I really like it. Um, but I don't want to do big paintings all the time. And these are not even that big, really, in the scheme of things. But I do like that sense of the field having the weight. And I do feel that there's something else that happens when they get bigger that's, that's good. So many things we're talking about. Well, the, the, the one thing I was thinking of was that last bit from Goethe on pain. Oh, okay. <laughs> so he says, he says that the eye sees only light shade and color, and and that's from that we construct the visible world. And he said because of that, it makes painting possible, and that painting is a more perfect visible world than the real world. And I thought it was so beautiful and so mysterious. And then we, we started talking about it. And I just yes. oh, how you interpreted that and shared that. I thought was, you know, because it, when you have a painting, your, your eye can actually see how these color relationships occur. That yes. you can, when you, you know, the rest of your mind and wandering attention and moods and everything is occurring, yeah. all of that's occurring, you can't see all of that. Yes. And painting gives you that moment to see it. Yes. And I, 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 when, you, when you speak about that, I just remember, and probably other people are doing the same thing, the, the memory of looking at paintings mm -hmm. over one's life, 
and having this feeling, and it's like, wait, how did that happen? <laughs> let me watch this, let me watch this. And you sort of try to reconstruct it, and then it changes and it shifts. And that, that pleasure of having something happen through the painting, and then you try to understand it. And, and that is very, it is very wonderful that that happens. And it's something you don't do in your life, because it, everything, everything has changed so quickly. And it is a way to, um, to what, hold on to, or to understand your experience. Yeah. Oh, hi. <laughs> I was just curious, since we're standing in front of this lovely set here, what were the things, are there certain examples of things that surprised you in the process? Oh my gosh. <laughs> like point to a couple things that you can recall. Wow, let's see. Um, I, guess, I guess this painting, I mean, that's, I'm, that's not a good thing to point out. <laughs> The, the yellow is both so strong and so weak. Um, and it's just the kind of pressure that the colors on top exert on the colors behind and the way that the, the pressure, I, I think it didn't happen in the study so, so much. There's kind of a pressure of the yellows that are on the bottom pushing back and then there's sort of a pressure of the blue greens that are hanging down, pushing forward. And there's a very nice kind of different kinds of pressure coming forward and back there, which didn't happen in the study. There were much, it was much more, um, you know, this piece of the plastic didn't have that same quality of, of, of pressure. Um, so that excites me a lot. And I, I think that, that one is an unusual painting. I don't think I really followed that up. And I'm also, uh, I was wondering that because some of the works are more uh, explicitly, you see more translucent, and mm -hmm. some of them you would see some like more opaque brushes thrown over that is layers. Yeah. Is it something that those works happen later in the series, or no, like the translucent one that has a more kind of like a fading borders happen? Yeah. Later? I think the, in this show, the ones with like a lot of brushwork were a little earlier, actually. Yeah. Yeah, but all I mean, most of them have some brushwork. It's, it's unusual. There are just a couple that don't have anything. Yeah, and this is because of creating more emotion and more emphasizing on that specific point, or I'm just wondering. Well, I think this painting, for example, this painting it just didn't move, and so the brushwork was really to get it moving. Um, and in some of them, it's not like that. In some of them, it's more to, just to press on it. So that's, in, 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 you know, in, in some of the older ones, it was as if the, I couldn't get the color to really move. And so I needed to have that happen. And now I don't use it as much as a corrective. I think that's the difference. Now, they're going to be what they're going to be, but I'll do something to them. Yeah. You have a couple of different kinds of compositions. There's some things that are more minimal. In this bathroom, there's some that are more complex, I'll yeah, say. That's right. Are you doing all these things at one time? Is this your next direction? How you know, does this work? <laughs> it's a funny thing because I usually think of, you know, I'm like yelling at myself all the time. You know, if you're a painter, you're yelling at yourself. You're in your studio, you're all by yourself, but it's really noisy. <laughs> so it's like, I shouldn't do it like that. I should do that kind. I should do this kind. You know, so all the paintings are yelling at each other and I'm yelling at them. And, and then when Christine put up this beautiful show, it was like they're all in the room together? Wow. <laughs> no. They all look really good together. But that's my usual thing. It should be more complicated. OK, now I've done this one. Now I'll do them all like that. And then I'll come up with a study. <laughs> it's, it's simple. It's like, oh, I thought I was going to get them complicated. So it's sort of a lot of conflict. But they're, I'm sort of doing them all at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, do you? I just wanted to ask if you could say a tiny bit more about this idea of color desire mm. beyond just, you know, your eye tracking across the painting. Yeah. Oh, so I guess, I don't know if I, if I tried to say it before, and I don't know if Goethe said anything about this. I'm wondering. I'm wondering. Yeah. I'm wondering. Yeah. 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 Have you read the whole thing about this? <coughs> Not all. Yeah, most of it. Yeah. So I guess my sense is that the eye wants the whole deal, the, 
you know, you want light, you want all the colors. And you have the cones in the eye, and you know, if you have a red, red thingamajigger, it, you know, you'll create green after image because the eye wants all three primaries to be there, right? So somehow or another, I've like made that into a story that the eye really wants it all. And how are you gonna give that? And that you have to give it with some of life's story, uh, otherwise it's not interesting, and you have to give it with some tension, and you have to give it with some yearning, and that's what painting's about, and it's always been about that. So that's kind of how I think about it, as building, but not building too fast and not building too obvious. Because if you put in red, yellow, blue, red, what are they, red, yellow, blue, it's, it's a given, and it's not too interesting. So how do you create the desire in the eye for that all to, yeah. Do you think he gets into that? Do you, does that make any sense of anything? In, in a sense, because he talks about like the, you know, like the after image, right? Yeah. And how, I mean, he, the way he, he calls these subjective colors, and it's sort of like the eye and the world and where that boundary is keeps mm -hmm. moving back and forth. So it's maybe not, he doesn't exactly use the word desire, but he sees them as pulling on one another. Uh -huh. Yeah, there's so much that, that her paper gets into about how color is, I said I wasn't gonna try to do this, because <laughs> I won't make it, but how color is kind of the model, right, of, of our relationship to the world, because the world is so rich and so endlessly manifold, and we have our subjective experience of it, but we're basically, unless we're colorblind, having the same subjective experience, right? Yeah. yeah. So that has some philosophical significance. <laughs> I forget what it is. Well, it's, I, one thing he did talk about is that if you really wanted to see a, a, a philosopher lose his temper, really wanted to see a philosopher fly into a rage, talk to a philosopher about color. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> wow. So how are we for time? Are we going to this? Do you, do you listen to music when you paint? Oh, God. <laughs> so, I so, I just want to say, so Kandinsky related color yeah. to music. So his paintings are symphonies, right? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm very involved with music. So, do, can you relate to that then? Music, totally, color yeah. to music? Yeah. yeah. And seeing, so, seeing, like, yeah. seeing color when you hear music. Yeah. Like, well, the, like thing, the thing is that, um, the idea of it's like moving from place, from part to part, very much comes from music because um, the whole, you know, movement through time in music is something that I just, I just, I'm so involved with that. And sometimes that's missing in painting, the have you move from one place to another, and the modulation. And actually my, my, my mother was a, a piano, she was a Chopin specialist. So I come out of, you know, I come out of romantic music, but I also try to move away from it. But that's very, you know, very much involved with my whole, my whole aesthetic. I try, and again, as I say, you know, that, that was another time, it was another era, and I try to move away from that. But it's it's very key to my um, my sense of Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much.